book of the book of Ephesians is divided rightly uh, into two major divisions. The first half is theological. It is such rich doctrine about our salvation. It is it is uh, a blessing. And if you've not read the book of Ephesians or read it in some time, I encourage you to go back over it and just bathe in those first three chapters. And then the the end of it uh, is very practical. First the doctrinal, then the practical. And I want to back up uh, to an um, uh, earlier passage in chapter 4 to get us to run uh, up to verse 29 and look at this practical aspect of the Christian life. It's built on the theological truth of our salvation. And so the, tonight the message will be for those who are saved, for those who are in Christ, the only way you'll ever live a Christian life is to first be in Christ. Amen. You have to have real salvation. It is impossible for you, just as an individual, to live the Christian life. The only way you'll live the Christian life is Christ in you and Christ through you. Now, with that said, the true Christian is transformed. He is changed. And if you'll look, if you will, in chapter 4, verse 17, I'm going to just read from verse 17 and read on a little bit and give us a larger context. Our message should be not too long tonight because I'm just going to outline and break down one verse. But somehow I have a way of making even that long, but I'll try not to, okay? <laughs> so with that said, let's look in verse 17. And he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk, as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in, their, that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become calloused and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old man or your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self or the new man created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, that is in light of this truth, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let, here's our verse, verse 29, let no corrupt or corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. All right, well, we'll stop the reading right now. Tonight, I want to talk to you on Christian speech and the change and the transformation that should take place in the mouth of the Christian. In the context that we just read, we, we see that he's talking about the fact that the, the Christian should be different. He said back in verse 17, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. And then he says, In the futility of their minds, and then he talks about their understanding being darkened, and all manner of things that are corrupt and pure and sinful. We are not to live that way if we claim to be Christians. If we are true Christians, ours is different. 
We are saved by grace. We're not saved by merit. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of God's Son cleanses us from all sin. So we're saved by what he did, not by what you do. But having said that, that's justification. That's where we declared righteous. But the child of God, the Christian, is also being sanctified. And when a person is saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in them. They're born again. They're made new. And there is a radical change. Now, we're not going to be sinless, uh, and we can take comfort in these commands to be obedient and to, to uh, work in our sanctification because that tells me that it's possible for a Christian to actually sin. Sometimes folks might think, well, a Christian is sinless. No, that's not true. Uh, never would we have any commands to Christians to obey if that were the case. And so, uh, with that said, though, we still have an active role in sanctification. We are to be engaged into striving to please God. And we'll only do that through the energy and work of the Holy Spirit. But you and I are to be different. And we are to, um, in this work of sanctification, we are to put off and to put on. I think I may have mentioned this and talked about this. I, I forget when we met last time when I was with you. But look, if you will, in verse 22. Key verses on sanctification. To put off the old man or the old self which belongs to your former manner of life. The old you. And is corrupt through deceitful desires. Put that off. And verse 23. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And verse 24. And to put on the new man or the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we put off that old self, we put on the new self, this is active sanctification. How are you doing on that? There's all manner of things in the old life that is not of God, that is not pleasing to God. And don't just say, well, you know, this is the way I am. This is just the way I always been. No. Just like if I were to take off this jacket and throw it aside and then go over to a coat rack and pull a new coat and put that on. We put off the old, we put on the new. And that is the part of Christian sanctification. And so, with that said, he gives examples. For example, look, if you will, in verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal. Put off the old man, don't steal. Then he goes on, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. That's putting on. You put off theft. Don't steal anymore. Don't, don't covet after other people's stuff. Don't go uh, rob them. Don't steal. You're a Christian. Quit it. You're not supposed to do that. But on the other hand, get a job. <laughs> go to work and uh, toil and work with your hands and, and produce something, and then you'll have a, a profit and be able to even share to help others who are in need, legitimately so. And so we put off the old man of laziness and, and, and stealing and all of that and coveting and think you're going to get it all through the lotto or something like that. No, you put that off and you go to work and you be responsible. There's a change. The Christian is to be different. But another area of the Christian is to be different, not walk as the Gentiles walk, not in our former way of life. Another area that we're to be radically different is in our speech. And how we talk to one another, how we talk to our family members, and, and how we talk to a lost world, and how we talk to one another in the church. And there should be a marked difference in how we as believers talk. So go back to verse 29, and we're going to camp out tonight in this one verse. Let's read it again, verse 29. Let no, corrupt, no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that is, that it may give grace to those who hear. Tonight, I want to give you four points on the Christian's speech. Four points. And the very first point I want you to think about is what I want to call the root of communicated speech. The root of communicated speech. Look again in the verse, and it says in verse 29, Let, let no corrupting talk come now watch it, out of your mouths. That uh, word out of is a particular word. It's uh, ek poru estheo. And um, it is a word that's used in, by Jesus over in the Gospels. It's a word that is talking about proceeding forth. 
Ek is a preposition that means come out of. So you get the out out of the translation there. And the uh, porous uh, is something that travels or comes forward. And so don't let anything that is corrupt, we're going to see in a minute, come out of or proceed out of or go forth out of your mouth. But I want you to think about more profoundly what that is actually saying in the root of communicated speech. Just for a second, I'm going to chase a rabbit on this one point and go to Matthew 15. So uh, let's look at Matthew 15 real quick and uh, look, if you will, in verse 10. Matthew 15, verse 10. And um, you might know where I'm going with this. Do you? Jesus is uh, in Matthew 15, verse 10, he's going to say something I think that's very helpful about when we think about addressing our words. It says, and he called, I'm in Matthew chapter 15, verse 10, and he called the people to him and said to him, said to them, hear and understand. So look here, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, now watch, but what comes out of the mouth. Same Greek word, same word. It's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, of course Jesus knew that. He answered, verse 13, Every plant that the, my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. All right, we'll keep reading, verse 15. But Peter said unto him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? So you take food in, your body absorbs that, the waste is eliminated. Verse 18, but what comes out of the mouth, there it is again, proceeds from the heart. Literally, it comes out of the heart. What comes out of the mouth comes out of the heart. And this defiles a person. For, verse 19, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So briefly, let me just say that we need to understand this truth about uh, the root of communicated speech. It comes out of the mouth. But what comes out of the mouth comes out of where? The heart. We put it this way, uh, back in the south, we'd say about the old well, you know, the old old well, and you have a, a rope and all in a, in a bucket, and it goes down, and you drop the bucket down in the well, and you pull up the crank, and what's down in the well is what comes up in the bucket. If a person has a problem with their mouth, you know what that is reflective of? They have a problem with their heart. Because out of the abundance of the mouth, or excuse me, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's what Jesus said. And so we need to address not just the external, um, external trappings of our speech. We need to address the heart issue. And if our love for God is right, if our relationship with the Lord is right, if we're hating sin, if we're walking in the Spirit, if we're a new person in Christ, if we're appropriating sanctification, if our heart is full of love toward others, and all of these fruits that we are looking for, the fruit of the Spirit, I should say, if that is a reality in our, in our heart, then our mouth, what proceeds out of the mouth, will be different. We will be Evident that we are a Christian and we'll be giving evidence that we're being sanctified. And again, I ask you, what does your mouth say about you? Well, with that said, I want to go on to a second point. Not only the root of communicated speech, it proceeds out of. It's ek porus etho. It comes up out of. Not only that, I want you to not only think about the root of communicated speech, but I want you to think about the rottenness of corrupt speech. The rottenness of corrupt speech. Look at what he said again in verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Corrupting talk. That is interesting itself. That's a Greek term for the corrupt term is uh, sapros. Sapros. It is a term that is literally referring to rotten. Rotten, overripe 
fruit or produce or even um, meat that has become rotten because it's just set out and rotted. And, and, um, and I want you to just think about going by a trash dumpster and in that tra trash dumpster it's open and you walk by and there is all manner of rotten fruit in there and rotten produce and, and, and spoiled meat. And you get a good strong whiff of that. And that is this term for rotten. He says, don't let any of this rotten, contaminated, spoiled, uh, and I would add smelly <laughs> speech come out of your mouth. It is no good. There is the rottenness of corrupt speech. And, and this is the speech of this world. The speech of this world blasphemes God. The speech of the world is full of ungodliness, it, it, it laughs and mocks at the things of God. It ridicules those righteous things of God. The speech of the unsaved, the speech of this world, it is quite shocking even more and more in our modern culture. And so we should not be like that. It, it is, it is in co completely like a trash dumpster. I was a couple of years, I was, uh, when I was pastor at uh, First Baptist Church of Fillmore, California, they asked me uh, in that community if I would um, be the chaplain to the high school football team. I did that for two years while I was there. I only did it for two years because it was student initiated, student sponsored, and the student graduated. A student invited me, the coach approved, it was all fine, and so I came, offered Bible study, offered prayer. I was invited into the locker room during game time. I even was invited to ride with them on road trips and all that kind of fun stuff. Stand, stood on the sideline, and I loved those guys. I'd pray for them. I'd witness the gospel to them. And, uh, but uh, it became quite evident at practice when I was there. It became quite evident on the sideline. It became quite evident in the locker room that the speech of high school football players today is wretched. I played high school football we would never say those words in front of an adult. We didn't say them anyway. Some guys had pretty bad speech, but a lot of us didn't. A lot of, I didn't. I was a Christian. But you would never say that in front of an adult in general. You'd never say those things in front of your coach. And for sure, if a reverend, as they would call me, Reverend Hasty, a preacher came in, you would be embarrassed to say something like that. And I'm talking the file. I asked the coaches. I said, "Coaches, can't you do anything about this? This is crazy." And he said, "Oh no, this is our day. You know, we don't, we can't do anything about it." And I mean, they're using. I'm not going to defile your ears by trying to even spell it. You could guess. You don't need to. Don't worry about it. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is the world we live in. Even youngsters. By the way, before I leave this point, don't take God's name in vain. People. I, I, by the way, I'm not a racist. I'm against calling people things and using racial slurs. That's bad. And, uh, and people get upset with the N-word. I don't use the N-word. You shouldn't. Don't call people that. That's bad, right? That offends people. It, it's hurtful. I wish, though, our culture and our society was offend, as offended when people say OMG. I wish they were as offended when they take God's name in vain. I wish they were as offended and as upset when somebody blurts out the name Jesus Christ and uses it as a swear word. And church, I, you know, this is a problem. Our culture is so prevalent with this. Uh, when I was in Santa Monica, we, we had a Bible study group. I did a lot of open-air street preaching. We had a Bible study group and, 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 frankly, a small service. Sometimes I just preach in a room just like this. And there was a sweet sister, Lord. I know she loved the Lord. She she was faithful. We always come up, Pastor Sherwood, Bible questions, and she was trying to live for God. She would always say, oh, mine. And I was like, oh, sister, don't do that. Don't do that here in the church. Don't do that. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was that she heard it all the time. And, it was, and she knew after I explained to her she shouldn't do that. You say, is that wrong? Yes. God... You say, taking God's name in vain, what does that mean? Vain means empty. It doesn't mean you have to mean anything by, bad by it. But if you just speak of God in an irreverent way, a mindless way, and it's like you hit your thumb with a hammer, and, oh, or you see something, it's, oh, you know, and you just, oh, my, don't do that. When you address God, you address Him respectfully. 
you speak of him, you speak of him with thought intent about him respectfully. And our culture has so permeated and saturated this blasphemy or taking God's name in vain that even evangelical Christians who are, I think, otherwise striving to live for him mindlessly are letting that come into their mind and doing that. There are so many ways we can have corrupt communication. There are so many ways we can have rotten, vile communication, whether it's cursing, obviously we know that's bad, whether that's gossip about someone, things that can hurt others, or the way we speak to each other. Now, now I understand humor, and I am the most sarcastic guy probably in this room. Well, maybe not, but I bet I'll give anybody a race for it. But even that, I have to really think, okay, am I sometimes, you got to be sure the other person knows that you're playing. And a lot of times if they do, it's really fun, and you can do that. I look in the Bible, I see the prophets, I see uh, Micaiah was sarcastic. And I, there are times that, that, there, that there's sarcasm in the Bible. I, and I think sarcasm and a sense of humor can be a gift, but, but you have to watch that you're careful with, another person's feelings and you don't want to use a hurtful truth cloaked in humor that's really a hurtful dig that when they go home it hurt you don't want to do that to people you if you use sarcasm be careful about that now again I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody but I want to ask you are your is your words helpful or hurtful or your words how about you say oh yeah I'm a nice guy I'm a nice little sister Okay, well, how about when somebody does you wrong? How about when your sibling irritates you? Or when your parents put a demand on you and, and say you have to do something, you're like, look, I'm in college, leave me alone. You know, come on. You talk back, you use bad words, you know, you um, sass. Are you disrespectful? How about at work? And I tell you, I've had secular jobs. Man, you're talking about, again, the lost world doesn't think about what they say. They just don't. When I work construction, again, I'm like, you kidding me. I mean, <laughs> if any of you guys do that, you know it can be pretty bad unless you're working with all Christian people. And uh, so let no corrupt, rotten stench like, like, produce like fruit that's got fruit flies flying around it just stinks it stinks to God if it doesn't stink to you it's because you've gotten desensitized and we get so used to it I mean you just stand in the checkout line to get gasoline or you walk and you just hear people off the cuff just using this language and we just get used to it we get used to it we hear it in the media whatever we just get used to it and we think that's okay it's not okay a number of years ago, there was a prominent pastor who didn't mind preaching. He's no longer that active or that prominent that I'm aware of, but uh, he would use inappropriate language from the pulpit. And the people, there were young, young reformed people, say, oh, yeah, it's okay. He's doing it. He's my hero. It's not okay. It's never okay. So there is the rottenness of corrupt speech. By the way, uh, sometimes, you know, y'all are single, and I am too, but when you get married, they say that... Uh, a marriage can uh, really reveal a little bit about you. They, uh, uh, one preacher said, I was my own worst uh, critic, and then I got married. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, they, they even uh, and not married people, uh, like uh, the old story is of uh, Winston Churchill and Lady Astor. Maybe you've heard some of these, but, but uh, uh, Winston Churchill and Lady Astor is reported that Lady Astor said to Churchill, said to Churchill, if I were your wife, I would put arsenic in your tea. To which Church, Churchill quickly retorted, Madam, I assure you, if you were my wife, I'd gladly drink it. <laughs> uh, on another occasion, uh, it was reported that uh, the lady asked her, said to Churchill, Churchill, uh, you are drunk. To which Churchill said, Madam, you are ugly, but tomorrow I shall be sober. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, and these are funny to us now, but uh, imagine to the hearers at the time and to each other. And there are so many I could give you of those. And that can be corrupt speech that we can hurt one another with. And um, it can be real serious. A, a parent can be mad at a child and say, I wish you were never born. Or you could say something to your father or your mother and say, I hate you. You're always this. By the way, you're almost always wrong when you say you always. 
Keep your words sweet, because you may have to eat them later. Uh, many things are opened by mistake, it's been said, but none more frequently than the mouth. Don't say things in anger. Don't say things in haste. Calm down. Let it, the Bible says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. God gave you two ears and one mouth, and your mouth has a flap on it to close. The ears are always open, right? So don't say things when you're worked up and angry. So there is the root of communicated speech. There is the rottenness of corrupt speech. Third point, the replacement with constructive speech. This is beautiful. The replacement with corrupt speech with a correct, uh, constructive speech. Look, if you will, again, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion. Good for building up, but that which is good for building up. The idea of building up is oikodomain, domain. You hear a couple of words in that. Oikos is the word for house in Greek. Domain is also a word for the house top. It comes from another word uh, that has to do with building up the house or building the house. So domain, I understand that in Russian, what is the word for house, my Russian brethren and sister? What is it? comes from domain. And by the way, doma is in other languages. You've heard that, right? Domain is in, in English language. Uh, even your website, what's the home domain, right? Uh, there's other English words that are built off of this. So domain, um, so the oiko domain is literally the act of building. Like you're building a house. And it's translated also edification. And it comes from the idea of what an edifice is. What is an edifice? You say, oh, that... That building there is a beautiful edifice. Well, that's a building, a structure. It's been built. Edification is building up. And so, brothers and sisters, our speech is to have a function. It is not to be hurtful. It is to be helpful. And it is to build up. It is to edify. A matter of fact, Paul mentions edifying the same word, oikodomain, uh, in uh, the same chapter. Back in chapter 4, look at verse 12. And he's talking about building up the church, edifying the church, building the church. He says in verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave the apostles, he gave, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers, verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, watch for building up. That's it right there, oikoi domain, the body of Christ, to build up the body of Christ. And then look, if you will, in verse 16. Uh, or look back to verse 15, rather, it's talking about speech, speaking the truth and love. You want to speak right, you want to build up the body, you want to build up one another, you can't do it with lies, speak the truth, but do it in love. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, verse 16, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so oikodomain is that part there in the ESV that says so that it, here it is, builds, builds itself up in love. And so the body of Christ, the church, is to build itself up. It is to build up one another those who are gifted, the preachers and teachers and so forth, are, are to equip the saints, and, and it's to have an effect of the uh, building up of the body of Christ. And then our speech, uh, again, we are to speak the truth in love, which has that effect. And in our passage tonight in verse 29, that we are to speak that which is good towards the act of building up. Let me say a few more uh, terms related to that. It, it literally is, but, but uh, if any good, that is a good word, towards the act of building up according to the need. So there's particular needs. There are different times as the occasion sees fit. Someone, a brother or sister, they, you're, you're, their countenance seems fallen. You can detect that. You can have sympathy. You can, you can say, hey, bud, how you doing? 
hey, hey, hun, or you know, whatever you call one another, you know, hey, you know, don't, guys, don't go up to one of another guy and say, hey, sweetheart, though, don't do that. I'm kind of worried about, no, I'm just kidding. I'm supposed to build you up, not tear you down. Just play him. So, uh, uh, <laughs> watch it, Sherwood. But, anyway, um, but no, you go up and, and you, you know, uh, so notice it says, if there anything is good, agathos is a standard adjective for good. Uh, it's been taken to be a practical good. If something is useful, something is beneficial, something is helpful. Or, on the other hand, it could be taken just morally good. If anything is good that you can share, that you can say that is upright, that is fitting, that is good in a righteous sense, that is truth, or in another way you could say sympathetic good, compassionate good, gracious good. And so I just say to you, brothers and sisters, when you think about our stewardship responsibility with one another, we may come uh, to an assembly like this, a small group like this, uh, the college group, uh, uh, and, and we may be all absorbed with ourselves and come in and say, you know, I'm just, last time I came, not very many people talked to me, and, you know, I just don't know if I fit in here, or I'm just, you know, going through the. Don't do that. Don't come thinking about self and what you. Come try to be a blessing. Come say, you know what? I'm going to be sensitive to somebody else. I bet there's somebody else that, that's here, they, feel, they just feel left out. I'm just going to single them out. If I see them by themselves, I'm going to go find them. I'm going to go say a nice word. I'm going to say, you know what? Are you doing something different with your hair? It really looks nice. You say, well, it's just a compliment, a sincere, kind compliment. What's wrong with that? Um, are you, or just make sweet conversation. Or, or if you know they're going through something, or, or, or there's something you need to just pull them aside and say, can I tell you the truth on something? Speak the truth in love. Maybe they're getting caught up into something. Maybe they need adjustment in their thinking. As it is fitting. He says, as it is necessary, really, or as it meets the need, or according to the need. Notice, he says, but if anything good or any good towards the act of building up according to the need. And there are a wide range of needs. Let's just face it, human beings are needy people. And so we need to be not self-focused. We need to be concerned about the welfare of others. This is a heart of love. And again, speaking the truth in love. So on the one hand, we say, yeah, I don't want my mouth to be like an open garbage can with bad fruit. And you say, well, thank God it's not all that bad. I mean, I'm not like that. Okay, well, you don't want to have that. You want to be careful that the words you come out of your mouth are not rotten. They're not corrupt. They're not overripe. They're overripe. They don't have a stench to them. You don't want that. But on the other hand, there ought to be positive, helpful, biblical, truthful words that we use. This is replacement theology. I'm talking about in sanctification. We put away stealing, as we said earlier, and then we get a job and go to work, right? And then we have abundance, and then we can help somebody that's needy. That's putting off the old man, putting on the new man. It's not enough for, for me to come here and just say, quit saying bad things. Not that I'm aware that that's a big problem. Uh, I don't mean that. But, I mean, it's not enough just to say, don't do rotten speech. We have to affirm the positive. Do this helpful speech. Be thoughtful to do it. Be intentional to do it. It's a part of the mutual body of Christ. And don't just say something to someone that if you do, it's going to be reciprocal for you and your benefit later on. Guys, you see a cute girl, oh yeah, you're going to say something nice to her. Well, say somebody nice to somebody else that's no one's talking to. You go to the church and, and or go to a, a workplace, Show me how you treat the little nobodies that nobody's paying attention to. The people doing the menial work off the side and thank them. Someone that's, you know, maybe, hey, they're not, they're not up here doing the music. They're not the person you see all the time. But maybe they're, they're just back cleaning, cleaning up after everybody, wiping up messes. Thank them. Think about that type of thing. Now, let me move on. And by the way, I'm saying everybody should always encourage everyone. Let me give you a fourth point. We're on the fourth point. The first point was the root of communicated speech. It comes out of your mouth, but it comes ultimately out of your heart. 
There's the rottenness of corrupt speech. We don't want that. That's what this world has. There is the replacement with constructive speech. And um, that speech, by the way, I, I need to give you a few verses for it. I'm about to go ahead. Let me show you something before I get out of that. Uh, change gears. I'm not going to the fourth point yet. Can I do that? Okay, park it. We're going to look in uh, chapter 4 again. We already saw... In verse uh, 25, uh, or no, excuse me. Yeah, look at verse 25. He says, therefore, having put away falsehood, that's the put off, let each uh, one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one body. So you say, what kind of replacement speech should I have? Don't lie. Don't flatter. Don't gossip. By the way, you know what a flatterer and a gossip is? A gossip will say something behind your back that they won't say to your face. But a flatterer will say to your face what he won't say to you about you behind your back. Don't be either one. Be true. Speak the truth in love, we said. But here, put away falsehood. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Okay, well, skip down to verse 31. Verse 31 in our chapter of chapter 4. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. So there you put that off from among you, along with all, all malice. Verse 32, be kind. That's putting on to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. By the way, that is so great that you can say to someone, you know what? I forgive you. I love you. I forgive you. Be kind. Be tenderhearted. All right. Look, if you will, in uh, chapter 5, verse 4. Well, back up to verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. See, we're supposed to be different. Verse 4, let there be, watch this, let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place. But, so put that off, but instead let there be thanksgiving. That's what you put on. So don't have dirty jokes, inappropriate talk that is crude, crass. So you say, well, I'm not sure if what I'm about to say is that. Well, if you don't know, then don't, right? Don't, don't talk about sexual innuendo and, and that kind of thing. Things that ought to be uh, left that, that is, is discreet. Our culture knows no, no discretion anymore, but don't be like the culture. Look at chapter 5 and verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. That is, rebuke that even. Verse 12, for it is a shame or shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. That's really talking about bad moral behavior. But we don't want to go around talking about it. Now, there is a point to where we must address sin. I'm not saying we don't do that, but we don't glory in it. We are not to glory in it in our mouth. All right, well, that said, so that is some of the replacement aspects in our speech. Okay, now I'll go to the last point and we'll be done. You're listening well. So there's the root of the communi uh, root of communicated speech. There's the rottenness of corrupt speech. We don't want that. There's the replacement with constructive speech. We want to use speech that will build up others. And that get, leads me to the final point, the results from correct speech. Look at the results from correct speech. Go back to chapter 4, verse 29, and we'll look at the last clause. It says again, verse 29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. Now watch, for as, fit, as fits the occasion, watch this, that, that, or in order that, or for the purpose of, for the purpose that it may give grace to those who hear. There is an end result there is a purpose that comes from correct speech. It's an amazing thing to think that correct speech can do this, but we can, uh, we don't mean in a saving way, we're not God, but we have the ability as fellow believers to exude and set forth grace in their life, to give grace to them, to see that they can see the glory of God in our lives and that we are gracious ourselves and that we give the gift of grace that we model grace, and that our words actually do build up, do edify, do strengthen, do encourage, do point to God, do point to Christ, do strengthen them in their faith. They see Jesus in our life, and our words can have a very positive effect. They can actually give grace. Someone 
is cast down, we can give them grace. Someone is discouraged, we can give them grace. Someone uh, is tempted, we can give them grace. Someone is confused, we can give them grace. And we can quote scripture even. We can do all manner of things that will be productive and helpful. And that is the function of correct speech. And that's what I want to call you to tonight through the word of God. And so understand these points, my brothers and sisters. There is the root of communicated speech. What comes out of the heart, the mouth puts forth. There is, on the one hand, the rottenness of corrupt speech, and that ought not be us. We're different. We're changed. We're saved. And if that is a part of your life, if there's bad habits with your speech, it's time to repent of that. And then there is the replacement with constructive speech and we need to be intentional about that and Lord help me to help others and help me to help my brothers and sisters and be sensitive and build them up in the faith not tear them down build them up and then the results from correct speech it will do that it will give grace to them well how about you our words really do reflect a lot about us and may God be glorified by our words and may you be encouraged tonight to think about what you say, and may our words reflect Christian speech. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, we, we thank you for your word. Lord, this is a simple message with just simple points right out of a simple verse that's straightforward. But it's so straightforward to us, Lord, and yet none of us are perfect, none of us are sinless. And Lord, we pray that you would help us with our speech, not only that we would not have speech that is rotten, but that we would have speech that is helpful, that builds up one another, that encourages one another, and that is a blessing, and that, uh, that the love of Christ in our hearts would be expressed by our mouths. And Lord, maybe some are just shy about talking to others and saying things, or maybe they say, I just don't know if I'd say it right. It always comes out wrong when I start to, Lord, I pray that you would help each one to wisely, intentionally use their their choice of words to be a blessing in the lives of their fellow brothers and sisters, their co-workers, their family, anyone they're associated with, that they would be a breath of fresh air. Uh, while this world is like an open trash dumpster, may uh, each of us be more like a bouquet of, of flowers and just a sweet aroma first to you and for your glory, but secondly to, to build up others and to point others to Christ. Be glorified by our words, we pray humbly in Jesus' name. Amen.